Uh, can we start off with roll call, please? Mr. D'Amelio. Present. Mrs. Hall. Present. Mr. Siegel. Here. Uh, Mr. Holmes. Yes. Mr. McGarry. Here. Mr. Connell. Here. Mr. Wexler. Here. Uh, Mr. Oliva is uh, out of town this evening. Uh, Mr. Heilman. Here. Uh, we, I would like to start off with the opening prayer from Reverend Nishan Bacallian. With thankful hearts, we come to you this evening, dear God. We are grateful for the world you've created and of which you've made us a part. We're appreciative of the beauty of spring, even amid this rain, especially after this year's severe winter. We're also thankful for the tasks you set before us here in this meeting, as well as in our day-to-day -day lives. Help us to view this work differently, not just as responsibilities to fulfill, but as opportunities to serve each other in this place and this time. Remember those who have been elected to public office. Give them patience and wisdom. Guide and protect our public servants as they do their jobs. Bless and guide the families and individuals who live and work in our township. In this week, so many of us consider holy, we remember with sorrow those in other communities who have suffered the senseless and unholy taking of life. We ask for your mercy to be upon them. <laughs> Precious God, may the gentleness of this season and the strength you grant us each day inspire us to treat one another as neighbors and friends, and thereby reflect your goodness and your loving heart. Amen. 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 Uh, Bill, you want to lead us in? Pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, uh, we're going to start off with the proclamations. Uh, American Legion, 13-year-old prep baseball team. Okay. Who's doing that one? Okay. Larry. Okay. What's that? Baseball. I'm sure. Yes. Is this my court? <laughs> Banging a few times. Not my job. <laughs> um, uh, Mr. President, uh, now that Appreciate baseball it. season is upon us, uh, I wanted us to herald uh, the efforts of the Haverford Heat franchise for their uh, uh, terrific season back in 2013. And no better time than the start of the baseball season in 2014 to do that. So if I may. Uh, call up the Haverford Heat franchise and their coaches. Um, well, why don't I call the coaches up and then I'll bring the kids <laughs> up as I, uh, after I announce all their names. Whereas the Board of Commissioners of the Township of Haverford County of Delaware, Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, takes great pleasure in acknowledging the accomplishments of local youth sports teams. And whereas the Board of Commissioners wish to congratulate the Haverford Heat franchise for their American Legion 13-year-old prep baseball team's accomplishment, finishing their league with a record of 25-5. and five. The team finished in a first-place tie for the regular season Delmont Prep League, a 13-team league comprised of teams throughout Delaware and Montgomery counties. And whereas by winning a doubleheader on the final day of the playoffs, they advanced to the state championships in Spring City with seven other teams from Pennsylvania. And whereas the following coaches and players have proven the value of hard work, determination, and good sportsmanship. Coaches Jerry Hart, Dave Picorni, and Rich Buxton. And the following players, Dylan Brindley, Matt Corbett, Nick Donato, Drew Fowler, Cole Humes, Ian Humes, Corey Hunt, Matt McMahon, Sean Moran, Dylan Resnick, Gerard Sweeney, Anthony Warnick, and Kevin Zimmerman. Proclaim this 15th day of April, 2014, 
Board of Commissioners, Mario Oliva, President. homage to these kids. They're uh, not only a great group of athletes, and the American Legion Baseball is, at this age is the highest uh, baseball in southeast Pennsylvania. So for these guys to win the league was a great accomplishment, but also as individuals. Uh, I mean, they pulled for each other the whole season long, and they were incredibly easy for us to coach, which was very important to us. So, um, we're going to have one more. Many of these guys are back, and uh, Hope and get back to states again and do a little more damage at states this year. Thank you. Um, Jeff, Tara's not here. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Oh, there goes our entire crowd. Yeah. <laughs> hey, Black. Tara's not here. Tara's not here. So hold it. Okay. Okay, next, uh, Arbor Day. Oh, uh, okay. Um, Commissioner, this is a housekeeping issue that we have here because the, as a um, Tree City USA, each year we have to proclaim Arbor Day for Harper Township. So uh, this proclamation here says Arbor Day proclamation, whereas in 1872, J. Sterling Morton, proposed to the Nebraska Board of Agriculture that a special day be set aside for the planting of trees. And whereas the holiday called Arbor Day was first observed with the planting of more than a million trees in Nebraska, and whereas Arbor Day is now observed throughout the nation and the world, and whereas trees can reduce the erosion of precious topsoil by wind and water, lower our heating and cooling costs moderate the temperatures, clean the air, produce oxygen, and provide habitat for wildlife. And whereas trees are renewable resources, giving us paper, wood for our homes, fuel for our fires, and countless other wood products, and whereas trees in our community increase property values, 
enhance the economic vitality of business areas and beautify our community. And whereas trees, everywhere they are planted, are a source of joy and spiritual renewal. Now, therefore, Haverford Township Board of Commissioners do hereby proclaim the last Friday in April as Arbor Day in Haverford Township to urge all citizens to celebrate Arbor Day and to support the efforts to protect our trees and woodlands. And further, the Board of Commissioners of the Township of Haverford urge all citizens to plant a tree for, tree, for trees to gladden the hearts and promote the well-being of this and future generations. Proclaim this 15th day of April 2014. And, uh, and as opposed to the last Friday this year on April, uh, Saturday, April 26th and April 27th, they will be planting trees in Hireford Township, the tree tenders. Uh, just go online. You, you can Google actually tree tenders Hireford Township and it'll come right up. You can contact uh, Gene Angel for that project. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, the next thing uh, that we have actually is not on our agendas. It's uh, two of the members of the uh, Haverford High School robotics team would like to get up and speak to us. and 700 teams spread across 80 different countries. Of those 2,700, there are 110 in the Mid-Atlantic Robotics region, which includes Eastern Pennsylvania, New Jersey, and Delaware. And Haverford High School's Team 484 is one of these. Each team competes in district events to advance to the top 55 positions to qualify for the MAR Championship at Lehigh University. Team 484 was also one of these teams. Of these top 55 and more, only six advanced to the finals, the World Championship. Team 44 was one of these teams for the first time since 2002, beating teams from Strathaven, Upper Darby, the Mount, and many other school and many other teams who have a much more substantial budget. The school district has supported us every step of the way, providing a very well-rounded educational background, a generous contribu contribution to our budget, and has been very helpful in making sure all of our members are safe and competitive at each year's competition. However, even though the team has qualified to attend the first robotics world championship four times in its history, the club has never had enough monetary backing simply because of how expensive it is to run a robotics team and to actually attend this event. And that's exactly why we're here today, to spread the word about this important cause. Throughout the years, Haverford School District has been represented nationwide in many different areas of interest. We've had national diving and swimming champions, track stars, football and wrestling legends. Apparently, we've had some baseball stars as well. We've had scholars and actors and writers and Eagle Scouts and so much more. But we've never had any student, or, or student organization nationally recognized in the field of engineering while they've been studying mm -hmm. at Haverford School District. Due to the history of the team, we were caught off guard when we did well enough to qualify for the World Championship, which will be held in the Edward Jones Arena in St. Louis, Missouri, beginning April 23rd and concluding on April 26th. Because of this pleasant surprise, the team's budget has been proven to be insufficient to attend such an important event, even with our sponsorships from GE, Lockheed Martin, and the school district, and has left the 22 students on the team with quite the financial burden to join, this, to join the team in representing Haverford High School. We were looking to offset <coughs> the cost to our students as much as possible, and in doing so, are setting a goal of $25,000 to completely fund the team's trip, minus the cost of food and personal expenses for the students. This number, however, is only our ultimate goal. We realize that on such a short notice, obtaining such a figure is improbable. And we're hoping that we can raise as much as possible so that the students who have worked nonstop since the start of the build season, January 4th, can attend this spectacular event. We're not here to try and get money from the township. We're only here to spread the word and let Haverford Township know that their students are doing wonderful things in the field of engineering. As a community that's built on the hopes and dreams and the success of our children, why can't we get together and help our local robotics team get to an international competition of engineering excellence? 
And if you're interested in helping, if anybody's interested in helping, you can contact Ben Preddy at the Haverford School District. And just yeah. I was just kidding about the Malvern Prep thing. Malvern Prep was also on that list, and they left them off because I was a Malvern grad. So, uh, <laughs> so um, no, if you could do me a favor, Rick, can you email me some information, and, and I can pass it on to the other commissioners. Some of them have electronic emails. We could probably pass it on to our constituents, and, you know, yeah. you never know what could happen with that. If so. I, is Mr. Preddy still the advisor? He is. Okay, he is one. My, my son was involved many, about five years ago. Oh, okay. And Mr. Preddy is an inspirational teacher, and I wish the school district had even more like him because I'm sure working with him, if my son's experience is anything that can be replicated, was just sensational. Yes, he's a very interesting man on some levels, but he mm -hmm. certainly does inspire students. Yeah. I'll add to Commissioner Siegel, my son also was on the robotics, and he, uh, there were many stories ab about him, um, but, but all good stories, <laughs> all good stories. And, uh, and then he went on to uh, Penn State for engineering. So excellent program, absolutely. Mr. President. Um, if I could just ask, since you are on TV and this is going to start being shown tomorrow, um, if you could let people know uh, to whom they should make out checks or where the, they should be directed? Um, uh, any, t any checks should be made out to the Haverford Robotics Club. Uh, it's a separate account attached to the school account just because the finances are so expensive for the club. The club team. Um, with that, uh, I can't exactly tell you where to forward the checks. However, if you can yeah. find any student in the club or any mentor, uh, any adult who's working with the club. Is the school open this week? Are they on spring break? The school is actually not open this week. So uh, we are okay. on spring break. However, we are in emergency meetings because of this great news. Yeah. Oh, and I, think always I see you have a website, team484.org. Team484.org, yes, with contact information. Mm -hmm. Oh, and when do you need the money by? Uh, well, yesterday. <laughs> the answer to that's tonight. <laughs> So you folks need to fly out there. Or t uh, how, how is the team getting out there? We need to get there somehow. From what I understand, <laughs> we're actually going on uh, the certain members are going on a bus. With Chartering a bus. Two hundred and eighty-seven okay. oh. fifty round trip. However, some members might need Flying to fly to uh, rare due to the seating constraints because another robotics team is letting us join them. Oh, sharing a bus with you. Okay. Um, and can you tell us what you're presenting if you are able to go? Exactly what, do you have a specific presentation? Uh, yes, actually, we have a robot that competes in a, an event. Uh, it's essentially a sporting event for robots. We have a small robot that actually has to manipulate a 25 inch medicine ball into a goal uh, alongside two other robots competing against a, that's another team of three robots. Uh, like Kylie had mentioned, this is, there are 400 teams being represented across 80 different countries around the world, so it's quite the event to attend. Thank you. Okay, well, uh, Rick, if you can get some information to me or send out to all the commissioners, we'll make sure that we uh, forward it on and get the word out. All right. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, Good luck. Okay, uh, Township Auditor update. Um, uh, Mr. President, uh, Mr. Zlotnick won't be here this evening, um, but he has been corresponding with uh, Amy Cuthbertson and myself. Uh, Mr. Zlotnick reported uh, to uh, Amy and myself again yesterday, he reviewed a number of the um, invoices. Um, we produced a number of documents behind his request. He had a few questions and they were all answered appropriately. Uh, and he is confident uh, that there is no um, uh, no uh, further issues with any of the warrant. Okay. Okay, let's move on to the Citizens Forum. Uh, we have 20 minutes for a registered speaker, which there were none, uh, to my knowledge, and 20 minutes for agenda items only. So if there anybody, I'll start on this side of the room. <laughs> <laughs> How you doing? Uh, Tyler Wagner, uh, 
567 Strathmore Road, and uh, I'm here on behalf as a resident and as a uh, local active real estate agent, um, along with some of my other real estate agents and our uh, representative from the uh, S SRA, from uh, the Sperm Realtors Alliance uh, of the Sperm West Builders Association. Um, and we're, I'm here today to talk about point of sale issue with the uh, four inch curbing uh, requirement. On the um, whenever a house goes, to, uh, goes under contract and needs to go to settlement, they have to do the reinspection uh, of the curbing. And uh, a recent change about maybe a year or so ago, uh, making the requirement of at least four inches on the curbing um, has become a real issue uh, for sellers uh, in the township. Um, while buyers and sellers can both be involved in the transactions, it is, it is customary in this area that the sellers take care of these requirements um, because they're under the pressure of, of selling the house. They're committed typically to buying another house. And if the buyer doesn't want to take care of it, they can walk from the deal. So it's really the seller who's going to be uh, taking that cost and that burden. Um, the the uh, increase to the four inches was done so that there's more consistency among the cur amongst the curbs. Uh, however, throughout the township, that's not the case. Um, if people have to replace the curbs, they do have to have, they, they replace it with a six inch reveal. Um, so it, even if all the curbs on the street were three inches and looked good and looked nice, once they do the inspection of that particular house, they have to replace the entire block of those curbs. And now you have one curb bumping up with the rest being nice and, and level. So while I think the, the idea of the four inch curbing was a good idea, had good intentions, um, it's just had you know bad consequences. Uh, I've had many sellers with, with issues and costs, um, you know, people who bought houses three years ago who decided to sell and try to buy another house uh, are getting hit with a, a curbing issue that's costing uh, anywhere, you know, five to $10,000 at the time of settlement, which just seems kind of kind of silly for curbing. Um, so I guess the, the biggest thing that we're here to ask tonight is uh, for a moratorium on the curbing until we come up with a better holistic approach. If, if curbing is such an issue with the township and we want consistency, uh, it seems to me that if you want to create, you want to fix that in any, any time in the near future, um, it needs to be looked at um, maybe when they're doing, doing the roads or you know, creating some sort of low interest loan programs for, for uh, homeowners to take care of this on a, on a more consistent basis. Uh, if you did it this way, point of sale, it would actually take 36 years for the entire township to replace the curves and probably by then the old curves would need to be replaced again. So um, that's pretty much all I had to say for tonight. Uh, Unless you have any questions. I think we can tell. Any questions? No. Yeah, we got to wait till everybody speaks. Yeah. So. Yeah, you. we'll wait till everybody speaks. Good evening. Um, my name is Jamie Ridge, and I'm president and CEO of the Suburban Realtors Alliance. And um, when this ordinance was first introduced, we, we let you know of our I'm sorry, Mr. Ridge, can I have your address? Absolutely, yes. Um, 100 Deerfield Lane, Malvern, Pennsylvania. Thank you. And we were concerned about this ordinance um, when it was first introduced, and I think those can concerns have been really lived out, as you heard from, from Tyler. Um, what we're seeing is not, not more consistency, um, but a real hassle for people that are trying to sell and, and buy homes in the township. And we would just, again, um, urge that a moratorium um, be placed on the program until um, perhaps we can sit down and talk through some of the best practices that, that, that might be out there that you could use. Um, again, Something more comprehensive, I think, makes a lot more sense um, rather than the one-off um, curb replacements, which are much more expensive um, than replacements would be at the time of a, a road repair um, when you can do you know, all the curbs at, at one time. Um, and again, you know, we are open to, to working with you on this um, in any way that we can. Um, and uh, you know, I've given my card, Jane's got my my card and my contact information, and uh, we'll just look forward to that. Thank you. Anybody else? Is that it? We agree with that. I mean, it's just. Oh, well, you, had, you have to get up here and say it at the <laughs> thing. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Marcelli. I live at 632 Grand Avenue in Havertown, and I sell houses here in Havertown. I just have people that are moving. They're actually being transferred, um, and they've been residents for more than 25 years. 
They aren't planning on staying down in where they're being transferred to. They're planning on coming back, but they just got a $5,000 per bill. And they're leaving Havertown with a really bad taste in their mouth. After all, the, you know, their time in here, their taxes spent here. I'm not a very good public speaker. That's why I told you. I wasn't going <laughs> to But, I mean, they're very upset. I mean, they live on a so. corner. You know, it's a lot of money for them. As, as their listing agent, you know, I look like, you know, I don't know what I'm talking about when I tell them, oh, your curbs look okay to me. I mean, they're, they're very well um, maintained curbs. There's not a crack or a chip. They're all the same all the way around the corner. And they have to spend $5,000, and I just think it's ridiculous. It's hurting our business. And I live here, too. I've lived here for over 20 years. And I bills my, co my commissioner. I just, you know, I'm just, like, very passionate about it. It's just not fair. What about these old people? It's all they have. They have to go into these assisted living houses that, you know, places that have these big fees, $115,000 to $130,000. And they need all the money they can out of their homes. And we're making them spend extra money. And it's just not fair. Thank you. Mm -hmm. You did very well, by the way. Mm -hmm. Mr. President, mm -hmm. since this isn't, since these are non-agenda items, can we just? This uh, is an agenda. Put it on the agenda. Oh, yeah. it's on there. It's so on there. I didn't see it online. Yeah. yeah, it's number sixteen. It's at the very end. Oh, okay. It's not on Dennis the top. Oh, I see. Uh, run a real estate business here in the township, uh, 610 Old Lancaster Road. Friend Mark. Uh, just a note that um, Lower Marion uh, Township uh, addressed the curbing and sidewalk issue. They are still doing point of sale, but they have a program now where they are inspecting um, neighborhoods, essentially. One neighborhood, two neighborhoods at a time. Um, and marking the blocks and the homeowners, not anybody for sale, just homeowners are required to fix those sidewalks and or uh, curbing. So far it's, walk it's working well. A um, little backlash originally, but uh, now that all the homeowners realize that everybody's got to do it, or those with everyone who has a cracked sidewalk has to do it, it's easier to swallow. And they were able to get uh, contractors to give uh, better prices too than uh, at those point of sales, just one-on-one. -on -one. So, uh, so far it's working. They're hoping that within a two-year period, it's gonna be, that will be the way it gets done. It won't be in the point of sale any longer. Thanks for your time. Okay, sure. Anybody else? Okay. Uh, well, I guess since we're, that's a agenda item, we'll just discuss it at item 16. Is that okay? Thanks. Mr. Chairman, I'd, I'd make a motion that we change the order and do it now. While we we do it now, yeah. Well, we have uh, the people yes, here. As well. okay. if, if the board is so, rather than make the people wait Absolutely. until the 16th. Sounds good item. to me. Okay. Uh, do we have to do that with a voice vote? I guess yes. to move it? Okay. So moved. So moved. <laughs> All right, who's going to bring it up? Okay. Well, I think we should talk about curbing society. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can't make the uh, motion. The, uh, do I need to formally move to take 16 and make it uh, item I number? Think we just uh, did. We just yeah, did. we just okay. did. Okay. Um, we did. I, um, last week we had some you know, good preliminary discussions about this issue. A number of things have been raised. Um, the last speaker, I'm sorry, I didn't catch his name. Manley. Dennis Manley. Dennis Manley. Manley. Um, uh, I appreciate that point. Um, I do, I, I will bring up what I brought up the other day, um, and that is the concern that if I had my choice of fixing my curbs today or fixing my curbs um, one week before I sold my house and I knew I'd have the money then to fix them, uh, I, I'd likely put it off to when I sell the house. Uh, that doesn't help somebody who doesn't want to take a $5,000 haircut off the price of their house. Um, but um, it's, it's an expensive prospect for anybody to fix their curbs at any time. And the best time to do that is a time that they're going to have some money. Um, but it doesn't, uh, I, I do share the concern about consistency and I, I don't think, until the time that the township 
really takes this duty on to ourselves and either passes it on to the homeowners simply in terms of general tax increases or whether we assess homes for doing the work when we do it and when it's necessary to be done. Um, it's, I think it's just as hard on the homeowner whether they have to do it in, in, in April of 2014 or August of 2016 when they sell their house. Um, I guess if an entire neighborhood does it at once, you can get some economies of scale if you don't do it one, one time, you know, just one house at a time. Although I've asked Mr. Gentili to describe to me in, in, when we are doing the road projects uh, as to whether or not we can realize any economies of scale in, in, in fixing curbs, whether it's 10 feet at a time or 1,000 feet at a time. Um, and I haven't gotten definitive information back on that, but as I understood from Larry, there was not any significant marginal difference in the jobs, whether it was one house or several houses at a time. Now, I, I'm not sure if we either specifically really, you know, dived into that, but, um, and I, I think that's something we should think about before, uh, because I've always felt that the, that, that doing these on a bigger scale than just one house at a time makes more sense financially. Um, but I, the real, I think the real issue before this board is whether or not this is going to become a township responsibility or whether we leave it on individual homeowners, because I don't think there's a halfway approach. If, we, if the township goes and enforces neighborhood by neighborhood, every one of us commissioners is going to face a, a, a ton of grief from whatever neighborhood goes first, and then whatever neighborhood goes second, and whatever neighborhood goes last, five or six or three years into the process, Everybody's going to think it some political, um, you know, some kind of political considerations were put into play um, as we're doing, you know, that kind of enforcement. So I would worry about the uniformity unless we simply take it on at the township level and understand that that's just going to be the cost going forward of living in Haverford Township, borne by everybody as opposed to being borne by individual homeowners as it goes on. Um, it would appear, looking at Lower Marion, that some of their areas are done by the township as opposed by the individual homeowners. When you look at all the, the matching block that's throughout some of those neighborhoods, I don't know the answer to that. Um, I have said since I first came before this board uh, in 2001, I was here one of the nights at 2 o'clock in the morning when, when the board uh, tinkered with the curb ordinance. Uh, that I really do believe it is a township responsibility. It is a safety issue. It is a stormwater issue. It is certainly an aesthetic issue um, that any one homeowner can kind of wreck the aesthetics in a neighborhood if they simply don't comply. Um, so there are, there are a number of issues for us to think about. But to me, the threshold issue is simply, should this be a township responsibility? If it is, people have to understand that will add a multi-million dollar expense to the township's general expenses every year. And that's, that's the consequences of that. I don't mind that. You know, I, I think that's one of the things government ought to do, um, but that's, that's, a big, that's a big thing to swallow. So that's all I have for now. I, I think this is a, an issue for much lengthier and more significant discussions and analysis. Can I just add one thing, too? Yeah, please. Um, and I apologize. I should have had that information. One of the things that Mr. Pannoni's uh, department did for us is we actually looked at, when we were looking at the road program, um, cost per, uh, per, per uh, foot on what it would be to add. So we do have those figures, and they were done about a year ago. Um, I'm actually checking uh, my computer now to see if I can access it. But we do have those numbers to kind of give us the idea, but it literally was exactly what you said. It was a significant amount of money. In addition, the way the township has been handling the road program, obviously we, that's been funded through capital, uh, uh, through bonds, capital uh, uh, projects. Uh, we've been doing it every other year. This year we only have approximately $800,000 left in the funds to do our road program. So we're not gonna get many streets out of that, uh, especially if we were to do um, the curve along with it. You would, probably get maybe two streets done yeah see I, I to me I mean in this in the township you know we've got neighborhoods where you know neighborhoods such as mine the sixth ward I mean our typical property in the sixth ward is a tenth of an acre um, a typical one block stretch of road uh, in, in my ward might have 10 curb cuts in it 
So there is no, the marginal cost of doing those, doing those curbs, literally 50 feet or 60 feet at a time, um, you're, not gonna, you're not gonna make any savings by doing that on a large scale since it's, still ju since it's just gonna be 40 small projects as opposed to you know, the hundreds of feet of curb you might have in other neighborhoods. So it, it's, it's, not a, it's not gonna be an easy analysis. Um, and you know, depending on um, you know, when you're doing an entire road, uh, it's still, that said, while a company is doing the road, that might be the time to get the work from these folks because, you know, it, it may have just a, uh, there may be less marginal cost to doing the curb at the very same time the road is done. Um, and, and again, those are, we should invite data from the, from our various real estate professionals um, who know what our homeowners are paying to fix their curbs and, um, and whether or not the jobs have any marginal increases or decreases depending on the size of the job or the scope of the job. Um, but I do recall you saying to us a year ago that you had the data on adding the curbs and it was a significant per foot cost. Yeah. Mr. Chairman, I'm sorry. No, 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 go ahead. Um, I have real concerns about putting this on the backs of the taxpayers. Mm -hmm. I really do. Mm -hmm. um, I, don't, I don't think it's fair. If it is a significant amount of money, which, you know, preliminary, it seems that way, um, I have concerns about that. There are neighbors that, uh, residents that are going to stay here. They're not leaving. Families are coming in. So to add this tax burden to them would be unfair. If you're selling your house and you're moving, generally you're, you're moving up or you're, you're moving to... Um, moving down somewhat to in some cases if you're you know over 55 I guess some people moving over 55 communities and whatnot but my concern is that we would raise tax this will be another tax burden to the residents and I don't want to see that I do want to see some sort of uniform curb uh, resolution but what that is and how we do it it's you know I guess we have to figure that out but um, I'd like to know what the numbers are before we I, I would like to know. I would like to know what the numbers are, real numbers, you know, before we even vote on this. I think that that would be a smart idea. Um, you know, D Dave, can I ask you a question? Uh, sure. um, you researched this. Well, we've been for years now. We've been looking at different ordinances and and, and what the township, our township does, and other towns. Yeah. Can I clarify Can I? one thing before we get into this with Dave? Uh, I'm looking at uh, the ordinance from uh, Upper Dublin, and correct me if I'm wrong, but it says, please understand that in accordance with the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania First Class Township Code, the cost of concrete curb, sidewalk, and driveway apron replacement must be borne by the property owner. So is that incorrect, Lori? Because they cite this and they say download chapter 107. And I think this is what we're, we've got to push and pull on this. Yeah, there's, mm -hmm. um, there's a section in the first class township code that provides that municipalities can uh, require uh, the laying out, grading, paving of curbs, sidewalks, things of that nature, and the cost to be borne by the property owners, or if they fail to take the action to do it levy a municipal lien against the property owners right. and then there's one section at the bottom that says the municipality may undertake this the uh, may bear the cost themselves so okay because they don't cite that here they're telling their imperative language that one group or another other must must, must. It, it provides the authority for the laying out paving gives uh, options for the collection of the cost and most of that language in 2301 is related to um, uh, how the municipality collects those costs. Okay. Uh, but then there's only one sentence about the municipality. Right. So can I ask you a question? Go ahead. I, I didn't want, mean no, to interrupt right. you. No, I just wanted to clarify that on that. That's a good point, and that's sort of what I'm saying. But currently now, um, if we sell a home, you probably have more experience with this. Uh, what are, the, what are the, the laws governing changing the curb right now other than the height? 
If there's a crack, a minor right. crack. Right, a crack, a crack has to be. A minor crack? A, it, can they any be cracks at all, basically, any, any crack. cracks at all. So if they're cracked. it can be repaired in some, no. in some crack filler or something like no. that. No. The whole curb's got to go. whole curb's got to go. Uh, that's a significant amount of money. Well, when curbs you and not, when you get to an apron not cheap. on a driveway, right. Right. And, and here are the other piece Good of it. the sidewalks, too. And the sidewalks, it does become costly. And what I have found, and I, I did point out to Tyler the other day is that I always get three estimates and I think we tend to be under the gun sometimes with settlements and try to you know get things lined up and give our listers the best information possible and sometimes what happens is you know you have to get it done and some of the contractors I've seen I can't believe the difference in pricing it's it's yeah. It's astronomical to me. It's astounding to me that there can be such a huge difference. So I've tried to do that with all of my clients is make sure that I get them three estimates so that they can choose the best and in a timely fashion. But we did discuss that last on a working session. Mr. President? Yeah. We, can't have a good, we can't have a back and forth, unfortunately. At the end yeah. of the meeting, there's more time for public comment. So, okay. Well, you can't, you can't, can't, we can't, can't Sorry, I can't do it. At the end of the meeting, you, you can, there's more public comment. So, sorry. Mr. President? I just want to provide some historic basis for the evolution of this ordinance and to clarify some things that have been said tonight. When this issue was raised before the board, the ordinance was originally presented to this board back in October of 2012. At that time, because of concerns with the ordinance, the, mo the motion was tabled. At that time, the Ordinance Committee, um, and in consultation with Mr. Pannoni, Ms. Hanlon Whitup, et cetera, we reviewed a variety of ordinances from not only this township, but from neighboring townships, and provided what we thought was a compromise or a, a workable proposal. Looking at the minutes um, from the meetings after those ordinances were proposed, there was no public comment that suggested there was a problem. Obviously, that can happen because in retrospect, there obviously is an issue now. Um, but I think it, it just needs to be clarified that the minutes reflect that no one objected, no one raised any concerns. Obviously, we, we see that there is an issue now and we need to address it. I would strongly oppose a moratorium or anything that doesn't enforce the ordinance until or if we come up with something else, because that would mean that we would be allowing sellers to sell properties with dangerous conditions, um, because sidewalks and curbs can create dangerous conditions and hazards that impose liability primarily on a homeowner and secondarily on a municipality. Um, there's ample state law about uh, secondary liability of municipalities. So I can't see that that is a workable solution. We can go back and look at other alternatives, uh, but I think we just at le least need to know the history of this ordinance. And it was and it was approved uh, initially with an eight to one vote, and then by a nine to zero vote. And on the general merits, I, I completely agree with Commissioner D'Amelio. Lori and Dave, did you want to speak to to this for us, um, I if you don't mind? I think that uh, in terms of having for townships ordinances, you've had ordinances on the book requiring laying out of curbs um, and gutters in the township since 1935. It was right. prior to... Um, uh, all of the ordinances being consolidated into a single code of ordinances. So once the um, ordinances were codified, it, it carried over in 1960. It made reference to the historical document establishing it and, and set forth the provisions that were almost identical in, in terms of the content um, to the first class township code. Um, there is a provision that would allow by notice uh, of code enforcement for um, uh, just the general enforcement of any violation. Haverford Township does do that if we've received notices of um, tripping hazards, uh, broken curbs that are leaning, uh, where we get resident complaints, we do respond to them. Uh, also, there wouldn't be, it wouldn't be too difficult to modify the terms of the existing language to, to add a provision similar to Upper Dublin's um, uh, provision. If we're doing a road program, we could look at, 
we do a video inspection of the curbs and sidewalks at that we time do. anyway. We right. can look at that and maybe add that. And I do think that this is in the ordinance committee right now. Yes. Yeah, I was just about to say. Okay. Anybody else? Well, I just, I, I, the issue about whether this is taken on by the township or taken on by the homeowners, the bulk of our tax dollars come from the 17,500 homeowners that we have in the township and the idea that the cost of repairing all of their curbs would be spread out among the 17,500 homeowners as opposed to each one of those people paying one 17,500th of the cost of doing that. The question is, at the end of the day, can, this, can savings be, be realized by the economies of scale if we do these on a bigger project? Um, two, is there some value to the safety problems that arise in the issues of curbs not being repaired until such time as an owner decides to sell their house, in which case by then you can have a great deal of deterioration. I mean, Laurie, I appreciate your point about broken curbs, but it's really broken curbs to the extent that the broken curb becomes a safety problem, leaning into the road um, or otherwise crumbling. But I mean, all the curbing can be missing from the front of a house and it does not get sighted until such time as someone tries to sell that house and fix that curb. So if you have a storm runoff issue on a, on a fairly steep street and, you know, you've got a great, you know, you've got terrific stormwater management in, in this neighborhood because uh, the, the curbs channel the water down to three or four really good, um, you know, uh, really good water collection areas, but three or four houses have curbs that are flat to the road and the water's diverted into the property or up a driveway or somewhere else into some other place where we don't intend, that's not gonna get fixed. That water problem is not gonna be fixed um, in the time that it should be fixed or in the manner that it ought to be fixed if we have to wait till those homeowners simply sell those houses in order to get those curbs fixed. So. So if we find out at the end of the day that it is no different in cost of having, a, having me fix my curb when I sell my house as opposed to having the township fix all the curbs and I pay the marginal cost associated with that, we'll have to decide whether there is some value to having these done on a more uniform basis, having neighborhoods done at the same time and realizing the safety and the aesthetic issues that are good for the township as a whole if all the curbs are done at once and maintained on a more regular basis. So at the end of the day, there is a value to the township and to all the homeowners, even if the costs are the same or even if the costs are slightly more. So, you know, if the township was in the, was, if the township owned our water supply now, we would, we would be collecting, you know, the fees for water usage through the township. Nobody would say, that that's an unfair burden on the homeowners. They need water and the township's the one that has it. Every house needs curbing and if it's a township doing it as opposed to privately doing, it's just a question of whether you write the check to Abenezio Construction or you write the check to have it for township and they write the check to Abenezio. So it's, I do think it's offsetting. I'm gonna ask but, Lori well, a there, question. There are also, you have to keep in mind in, in like Haverford itself, there's hundreds of houses that don't have curbs at all. I mean, uh, you know, all of a sudden... Those wards, there's yeah. a lot that doesn't have curbs. There's uh, the fifth ward probably... Fifth ward, too. A third of the fifth ward probably doesn't have curbing at all. And do we have any basis for that, other than the fact that that street just happens not to have it, and every street on my basis. ward is expected <laughs> yeah. to? Right. Uh, you know. So if I just pull up all the curbing in front of my house and say this is now a no curb house I, I from think, now on, I don't think that'll work. Do I not have to do them anymore? I, I think what you'll have is you'll have an eight to one vote. It's not going to be a tax or a fee, but I do agree with some of the points you made about the safety and the inspections throughout the prolonged period. If if we were inspecting sidewalks today, all the people that run and jog along Steel Road through Lenar Country Club, Lenar Country Club would have to replace three quarters of that sidewalk, the tree bumps, the the, the cracks. Uh, the difference in there, uh, there, there's definitely safety hazards. We have people running in the street now because you can't use the sidewalk. Mm -hmm. You can't have kids ride bikes on it because you hit, you hit a bump that'll flatten the tire or throw okay. the kid over the handlebar. So, so I, I, you made some good points about doing it on a prolonged period, and we, you know, we probably, I'm hoping, and if the ordinance committee is not fully staffed, I'll volunteer that we need to look at it from a safety and ongoing perspective along all the time, both sidewalks and curbs. I, I'm a proponent, curbs move water, 
to sewer inlets, and that's their major point. I'm not as big on there. If, if, if the reveal is four inches or six inches, I, I don't really care because we pave the streets every couple of years, and, and you're changing the reveal. We're doing it, not the homeowner. So, you know, you've got those justifications. If I bought a house three years ago, the seller put in a six-inch curb, and we came along and had, heck, my, half the streets in my ward have to be repaved because of all the potholes anyway. So they're going to come up two more inches now. Yeah, uh, but they're going to get milled down. Right. So they'll get milled, but, but you still end up lowering the reveal of the curb over time. Mm -hmm. If you pave it twice in 20 years, you're down to about three and a half inches. So I, I'm all for the safety, looking at the sidewalks and the curbs on an ongoing basis, but it's private property. I don't think we're going to go in and tax everybody for doing that. So. Mr. Chairman, can I say something, please? And ask Lori a question as well. I mean, I agree with the safety concerns, and, and you walk around any of our neighborhoods, and some of our trees are bringing up the cement sidewalks. And the bottom line is that's not the township's responsibility. If it's bringing up the sidewalk on my house, it's the homeowner's responsibility. So am I right, Lori? If somebody falls because your sidewalk is cracked very bad, or even 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 the curb, it's your responsibility as a homeowner. It's not the township's responsibility. Our ordinance provides it's the property owner's responsibility to maintain the curbs and sidewalks. Right. Yeah. Right. And, and uh, I hear, you know, this, obviously the water issue and, and the curbs direct the water, but we've never had floods because of curb, uh, or curbs that are broken. Have we had flooding, significant flooding anywhere because of it? Let me be clear that um, if we receive a complaint or water and building up. And make an inspection, and we see that we have just a very small reveal. On the You'll curb, do something. And the township engineer feels that that is contributing to the problem. We actually can require, and it's mm -hmm. well. That's that's that fine. That's good. Take corrective, take action. corrective so, action. Again, we'll re we'll respond to any of those uh, sorts of complaints. But you'll do that with sidewalks too, right? If correct. it's so bad, you can go and cite the homeowner. Right. Correct. Right. We we just don't have a formal program to go out and evaluate. No, I, I understand. Yeah. I understand. And that's apparently what we need. Is that a program? That's something we should look at. Anyway. Yeah, I mean, if the Lower Marine has one, we can look into their program to see what they have as well. But, I mean, we, you, the issue with uh, Winfield, you know, where the homes behind there had uh, water issues. And I, I think that the construction that was done over there was absorbed into the homeowners paid for part of that, didn't they? Uh, their property part of it? They did, but at the same time, the work done on that wall, which was township work, was not would not have been effective without going into the private property right. of the well, people they, and making sure that it, it was rooted in a good place. So, as a as a consequence, as a necessary consequence of making sure that wall job was done correctly, we needed to do the we needed to do the the private drive behind there as well. Um, the private drive was done with the, the homeowner could either pay their portion of it at that time or the township could put a lien on uh the property and they could pay it a, a what it was you're talking day. about winfield drive yeah the yeah winfield, winfield drive yeah, yeah. i was done with a grant an h2o grant h yeah and that was, was that, HUD, right? did the homeowner pay so the homeowner didn't have to pay for homeowners anything? did not pay there no no but the but the 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 what went into that the analysis that went into that was that for us to do the wall job that we absolutely had to do we needed to go ahead and do the whole road and do it under our supervision and do it under our standards so that we knew the wall had integrity. And since we had the H2O grant over a million bucks to do that, it was, you know, it was a one-time thing to fix what had become just a disastrous situation. Some of which was neglect from homeowners, but most of it was, was just the wear and tear and neglect on the wall. Well, I'm still for what I mentioned last week is that, I mean, right now, um, I agree we can't change anything tonight, but the homeowner absolutely should be aware of it out there, and it should be in this next publication mm -hmm. uh, if it's that big of an issue. Like I've, I've gotten phone calls from, it, well, four of them in, in my area that they were unaware of it. So, And that was their biggest concern, that here they were going to settlement, and they came across this... Oh my gosh, I had to put out this. Yeah, I, this had the same, and, I have the same issue. And again, I, you know, I stress that, you know, part of our job is to, on the first listing appointment, point out the UNO requirements. I don't care what township you're in, that's part of it. I think that we'll take it if the board, it is back with the 
Ordinance Committee. And I think that we have to review everything surrounding us and all the, all the township all the townships surrounding us and try to come up with the best possible solution because it is an issue. I mean, I deal with it every day as well, and it is a big expense, but it's something that, you know, is well intentioned to try and do something so that we have some uniformity of repair. And, you know, whether it was, I, I don't care, I don't think it was good at three and a half, I don't think it's good at four. I just think we have to do something. So what that is at this juncture, I'm not sure, but I think putting in the newsletter is a good thing, and I think that as realtors, it's our responsibility to do our best as well. If there's anything else. Anything else? It's good? Okay. All right, let's move on. Um, Make a motion to approve the regular minutes, meeting minutes of March 10th, 2014. Second. Uh, any discussion? No, no there being none, uh, let's call roll. Mr. D'Amelio? Yes. Mrs. Hall? Yes. Mr. Siegel? Yes. Mr. Hohn? Yes. Mr. McGarity? Yes. Mr. Connell? Yes. Mr. Wexler? Yes. And Mr. Hallman? Yes. Uh, can we go on to the approval of warrants? Mr. President? Yes. Mr. President, I move we approve the following warrant, number four of 2014, totaling $3,371,426.14, comprising the general and sewer fund payroll from March 13, 2014, in the amount of $636,643.36, the general and sewer fund payroll from March 27, 2014, in the amount of $635,335.05. General fund disbursement number four of 2014 in the amount of $1,459,668.30. Sewer fund disbursement number four of 2014 in the amount of $281,773.69. Community Development Block Grant Fund Disbursement Number 4 of 2014 in the amount of $47,644.90. The Cable Access Equipment Fund Number 4 of 2014 in the amount of $400. Capital, project fund, Capital Projects Fund Disbursement Number 4 of 2014 in the amount of $118,935.15. Scheduled debt service payment on the series 2013 bonds in the amount of $187,791.26. And a credit card statement ending March 28, 2014 in the amount of $3,234.43. Second. Mr. President, uh, though our solicitor is not here, I know our solicitor has asked some questions and had them answered to his satisfaction about these warrants. Uh, the auditor. auditor. The auditor. The auditor. I'm sorry, what did I say? Solicitor. Solicitor. Yeah, well, I meant the auditor. No offense. Um, but thanks. <laughs> None taken, I'm sure. Um, and uh, any questions he has had have been answered to his satisfaction, and uh, I believe we would, uh, uh, we would be approving this, uh, uh, you know, not over his objections. Okay. Any discussion other than that? Call the roll. Yeah, I'm sorry, who yeah. seconded that? I did. Oh, I'm sorry, Bill. Okay. Mrs. Hall? Yes. Mr. Siegel? Yes. Mr. Holmes? Yeah. Yes. Mr. McGarity? Yes. Mr. Connell? Yes. Mr. Wexler? Yes. And Mr. Heilman? Yes. Item number seven. Make a motion to adopt the first reading of ordinance number P5-2014 by establishing or amending traffic restrictions on the following highways. Exempting the residents of the 300 block of Westchester Pike from the two-hour parking restriction. Also providing sticker parking only on Vernon Road from 7 a.m. to 4 p.m. Monday through Friday. Where's the 300 Second. block? Uh, Second. Where's the 300 block of Westchester Pike? Just before, between Darby and uh, the L.A. Fitness there. Okay. Halls. No. Okay. Soul, Tip O'Leary, Vernon Road down there. Okay. <clears throat> Vernon Medical. Oh, so is that a 
Is that a residential exemption, meaning they're going to get stickers? Yes, I believe so. Okay. They'll have permit parking, basically, from Monday to Got it. Okay. So it's still two-hour parking on the 300 block, but anybody who lives on the 300 block will get an exemption. near it gets some kind of sticker or an exemption. Correct. Okay. Anything else? Call the roll. Mrs. Hall? Yes. Mr. Siegel? Yes. Uh, Mr. Holmes? Yes. Mr. McGarry? Yes. Mr. Connell? Yes. Mr. Wexler? Yes. And Mr. Holm? Yes. Number eight. Okay. Number eight, resolution number 1931-2014, minor subdivision 2217 Winton Avenue. Motion to adopt resolution number 1931-2014, approving the minor subdivision plan for Ryer Builders 2217 Winton Avenue for the properties 2217 Winton Avenue, known as DC Folio number 2203-02279-00, parcel A, and 1250 Leadham Road, known as DC Folio number 2203-02278-00, parcel B, have been submitted to the, permit the subdivision of parcel A, a 9,002 square foot parcel into two lots, and reverse subdivision of parcel B, a 2,991-square-foot parcel. Uh, the, the, the lot areas are as follows. Lot 1, 6,132 square feet. Lot 2, 5,861 square feet. The subject properties are zoned R6, residential district, and located in the 7th Ward. The offer said plans were prepared by Catania Engineering and is dated February the 3rd, 2014, subject to the recommendations of the Planning Board. Second. Mr. President, I'd like to, um, the motion that you read on that piece of paper was the old one. There was a revised one. Mm -hmm. Leadham Road should not be in that, in that reading. Okay. Leadham Road was done a couple of meetings ago. Mm -hmm. This subdivision is strictly Winton Avenue in the seventh ward. There's a revised one on the computer. At the okay, uh, so, uh, strike the uh, Leadham Road then out of that uh, Russell P. ordinance. <coughs> And, we'll, and I'll second that one. Okay, so we're just voting on 2217 uh, Winton Avenue. Okay. Correct. Any other discussion? Good. Call the roll. Good with it, Commissioner McGarity? What is it? Are you, is this okay with you? Yes, that's okay. Uh, Mrs. Hall? Yes. Mr. Siegel? Yes. Mr. Holmes? Yes. Mr. McGarity? Yes. Mr. Connell? Yes. Mr. Wexler? Yes. And Mr. Holm? Exactly. Yes. Item number nine. Uh, Mr. President, motion to adopt resolution number 1932 2014 designating April as Fair Housing Month and that all employees and officers are directed to continue to promulgate fair housing objectives and continue to assist all persons who may fall within the scope of the Fair Housing Act and the Haver Human Relations Commission. Second. Discussion? Okay. Mrs. Uh, Hall? Call the roll. Yes. Uh, Mr. Siegel? Yes. Mr. Holmes? Yes. Mr. McGarity? Yes. Mr. Connell? Yes. Mr. Wexler? Yes. And Mr. Holland? Yes. Resol number 10. Resolution number 10, number 1933-2014, Pothole Assistance for Taxpayers Program Application. Motion to adopt resolution number 1933-2014, authorizing the township manager to submit application for county aid for the following purpose, to, ex to accept allocation of $25,164. Second. <laughs> Discussion? This is uh, the liquid fuels money from the county, Mr. Uh, yes, it's an additional yeah. uh, to the road program, yes. It's a, okay. a one-time um, event because of the winter. And again, but I have to stress, this is for Township roads, roads not right, state roads. Right, right. So, uh, um, although we, we were very lucky, there's uh, we don't have too many problems with the township roads. <laughs> but we get the complaints. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, I mean, Winwood at the top of the hill, right where Bryn Mawr and Allcott and all this is disaster. Oh, it's I, I, I was going to address this later, just in, in my section, but perhaps this is a good time to remind residents that 
you know, if their roads are state roads, which are a significant portion of the township, the township does not repair and we have no, and we're not permitted even to repair potholes on state roads. That's everything, Ardmore, Ellis, Darby, Lawrence, Westchester, Pike, Eagle, Manoa, uh, and, and a lot that I'm missing. Uh, we, excuse me? Marple. Marple, uh, Darby Creek. <laughs> Um, Darby Creek is a state yeah. road, and the Marple and Darby Creek are actually, both. Marple, being, I think, is a dirt road at this point. Isn't this it? point, I don't yeah. believe that's actually. Uh, Arlington Road is pretty bad too. Yeah. So the people under, have to understand Manoa. that the township reports it to PennDOT, but PennDOT repairs them on their own. Um, in the last, because in the last three weeks, I've received over a hundred emails relating to potholes, and not one was a township road except one that had to do with the that did not have to do with a pothole. Um, every one of them was relating to a state road, and we know the conditions are difficult, and we are reporting them. But it is not, you know, the, the, it's not the townships. We can't do it, let alone it's not our obligation. And if I could just add something yeah. to that, I mean, and again, the township, uh, Mr. Doherty, myself, um, and Mr. Cinebaldi and Lori, uh, at times we were on the phones with the PennDOT representatives, almost on a daily basis. They're aware of the conditions of the road. Um, and they have been out. In fact, they were out yesterday. But there's the the the, the, the conditions of the road, uh, at m in my opinion, and I think Mr. Pannoni would concur that uh, they're beyond uh, just a repair at this point. You just can't. It's just not. You're driving over and putting in some black uh, hot patch. It's not going to hold. I mean, uh, yeah, a lot of them, Larry. You got to mill and you got to do it over and smooth I, the whole thing yeah, out. And I it's just terrible. Don't, I don't know where they're getting that money. Yeah. yeah so I'm, but, uh, we are aware of it, and we're helping them out as best we yeah. can, so thank you. Um, call the roll. Mrs. Hall? Yes. Mr. Siegel? Yes. Mr. Holmes? Yes. Mr. McGarrity? Yes. Mr. Connell? Yes. Mr. Wexler? Yes. And Mr. Holland? Okay. Yes. Item number 11. Number, number 11, resolution number 1934-2014, liquid fuels. Motion to adopt resolution 1934-2014, authorizing the township manager to submit application for county aid for the purpose, for the following purpose, 2014 liquid fuels allocation of $66,960. Second. Discussion? There being none, call the roll. Uh, Mrs. Hall? Yes. Mr. Siegel? Yes. Mr. Holmes? Yes. Mr. McGarry? Yes. Mr. Connell? Yes. Mr. Wexler? Yes. And Mr. Heilman? Yes. Item number 12. Mr. President, a uh, motion to approve a planning grant application for the Department of Conservation and Natural Resources to extend the Darby Creek Trail north of the bus yard at Old Westchester Pike to connect to Haverford, Haverford Reserve. The matching funds for the grant will come from the Open Space and Trails Fund. Second. Discussion? Do you want to, Tim, you want, you want to talk about this, Tim? Yep, yep. Good evening, everyone. Uh, two things. One is this is the wording should be, and this is my mistake. We we sort of adapted over the last few days. We worked pretty hard. We're going to extend it both. Well, say planning grant. This is a planning grant. Come up with a plan to see how we can extend the Darby Creek Trail north up to the reserve, and then south from Murray Place down to Vermont Road, following along Darby Creek. So it's a completion of the Darby Creek Trail, just for clarity's sake. So what this is, is most of you I think are familiar. We were able to acquire a grant last two years ago to pave one mile section from Murray Place up to the bus yard. And uh, it's very popular. And our goal is to try to figure out a way to connect all along Darby Creek all the way up to the reserve. And part of it is there's some real challenges, especially Westchester Pike. And uh, so this is a planning grant to hire someone to come up with a, a plan to figure out how we could possibly make that work, including there's a couple spots where it would require easements um, in the Westchester Pike area. So that's what this is. It's not a construction grant. It's a planning grant. 
Okay. Uh, Tim, is there later a harumphing grant, and then maybe a... Uh, <laughs> uh, <coughs> so, Commissioner Hall, are you going to be okay with the changes there? Tim, I just, I, I wanted to ask, do you, do you need to, is this need to be rewritten? Is that what you're saying? It, it would probably be good if we could, just for clarity's sake. It, it's, it's only, the, the point of the motion is really, when we put in the grant, I'm going to ask Jeff to sign a paper at the end of the night, and it just shows that the, the elected officials are aware that we're going for this grant. So, yes, if you wouldn't mind changing it to a planning grant for the, the completion of the Darby Creek Trail. That's what they're oh, so we have to do the same thing for South. Yeah. To complete the Darby yeah, Creek Trail. Darby, yeah. so, so who seconded? Um, uh, Mrs. Hall. Uh, mm -hmm. Dan, Dan read it seconded. and Dan seconded. Dan seconded. It. So are you okay with the changes there? Uh, yes, as long as we're clear, are we taking? Yeah, I think we're clear, we're and clear? I actually have the proper um, okay. uh, e-grant right, uh, that Tim su supplied me, so I think we're okay. Okay, okay. and you're okay with it, Dan? Okay. Yeah, we all know that. what we're voting on. Okay. okay. Any other discussion? Accept it. Now, the only thing I'd like to comment, um, uh, that Murray Place Trail is... It was so busy this weekend, I thought we were going to have to send the police department there for traffic control. <laughs> it's <laughs> phenomenal. Is it? It Good. is a phenomenal... Um, that's nice. Answer. Okay. All right. Call the roll. Thank you. Uh, Mrs. Hall? Yes. Mr. Siegel? Yes. Mr. Holmes? Yes. Mr. McGarity? Yes. Mr. Connell? Yes. Mr. Wexler? Yes. And Mr. Hyland? Yes. Item number 13, purchases. Okay. Sanitation. Motion to approve the purchase of one 2015 International <laughs> Model 7400 truck under COSARS for rent. For Ransom International Westchester, PA, in the amount of $92,231.74, and one Leach 20-yard trash packer under COSARS for Grand Turk Equipment Company, Bridgeport, PA, in the amount of $68,010.50, for a grand total of $160,242.24. Second. Discussion. Um, I just make a, wanna, uh, this is we get a new truck, new trash truck every year, so this is just a routine for us, and we get about one hundred and twenty thousand um, dollars from um, our uh, grant money that we get from DEP that goes towards us every year as well. Okay, how long do we get out of a truck? Well, we have fifteen trucks. We replace one every year, so fifteen years. Fifteen years, yeah. 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 I guess. <laughs> Are they round I just numbers? <laughs> Okay. Anything else? Call the roll. Mrs. Hall? Yes. Mr. Siegel? Yes. Mr. Holmes? Yes. Uh, Mr. McGarry? Yes. Mr. Connell? Yes. Uh, Mr. Wex? Yes. And Mr. Holmes? Yes. Okay. Highway. Motion to authorize the removal of body and hoist from the truck 38 and install on truck 33 for a cost of $9,500 and install two stainless steel dump bodies and hoist on truck number 38, install a new electric tarp, hydraulic tank, lead lights, grab handles, and mud flaps in the amount of 33000 for a grand total of $42,500. Second. This is a retrofit here? Yes. Mm -hmm. And the, we're going to try for the first time, we're actually putting a stainless steel mm -hmm. dump body. A little bit more expensive, but believe we'll get uh, more longevity out of the vehicle. The 33 truck, which what? That's a highway truck. Yeah, yeah I'm saying what is? Uh, I think it's one of the dump, the big, dump, the big yeah. dumps. Okay, it's an opening. In the back. Okay, uh, is that it? Call the roll. Are you okay, Larry, with those lead lights? Oh. I am. Okay. <laughs> Mrs. Hall. Yes. Mr. Siegel? Yes. Mr. Holmes? Yes. Mr. McGarity? Yes. Mr. Connell? Yes. Mr. Wexler? Yes. And Mr. Heilman? Yes. Number 14. Mr. President, I move we award the Pont Redding Creek Diversion Contract to A. Garjul and Sons, uh, Incorporated of Brookhaven, Pennsylvania, in the amount of $281,375, submitting the lowest responsible bid. Second. I do know we have used A. Garjul and Sons in the past and uh, to the satisfaction of our township manager and he obviously uh, uh, supports this uh, award so I recommend that we award it. 
Anybody uh, else? I'd like to ask uh, Dave and Lori or one of the other two speak to us regarding this because I think it's a, a good example of the township working together with SEPTA to accomplish something that might not have happened as swiftly. Bad example. <laughs> Bad example, good example. It's good now, I think. About three years ago, Hartford College came in and expanded their campus in both dorms. In the, in the land development approval, this board, could put a, this board put a condition on that approval that Hartford College uh, contribute to modifying our sanitary sewer system <coughs> downstream of the college. We're having wet, wet weather flow issues in the Pont Reading area. We identified a way to, to address, the, uh, to improve the wet weather flows. College agreed to participate in about half, which is the half of, of the 280. We had to impact SEPTAs right away to do that. Over a year ago, Larry and I and, and Jim Burns met with SEPTA officials. SEPTA agreed that they would allow us into there right away to do the work. Um, frankly, it's taken until this week to get a verbal approval from PentonDOT with some SEPTA with a final approval we anticipate by Friday, right, on a sign off of an agreement. And we couldn't award this contract before that which is why you can see Garjul bid this almost a year ago. Garjul was not required to hold his number, but with written permission, uh, with his written authorization, we're allowed to hold his number. So he did give us that authorization. Lori, Lori and, and her staff and, and Commissioner Hall went to SEPTA and, and were able to sort of break that agreement loose from SEPTA. It did take over a year. I just wanted to thank Lori and Dave, both of you, because it was a, you know, it was, amount of work that you put into it. it took a long time uh, my understanding is you did too so <laughs> kudos to you as well Jean uh, <laughs> any other discussion no 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 call the roll Ms. Hall yes Mr. Siegel yes Mr. Holmes yes Mr. McGarrity Yes. Mr. Connell? Yes. Mr. Wexler? Yes. And Mr. Holman? Yes. Item number 15. Mr. President? Yes. Uh, I move we open money market accounts with uh, a money market account with Bryn Mawr Trust to temporarily invest uh, excess funds. Second. Discussion? Or Amy? Larry, these are unexpended funds at this point from our financings or are these excess tax funds? These are excess uh, tax funds, correct, Dean? Correct, yeah. Okay. From, from our, from the from current the tax collection we just did. And they're giving us the best rate. Great. Any other discussion? No, call the roll. Uh, Ms. Hall? Yes. Mr. Siegel? Yes. Mr. Holmes? Yes. Mr. McGarrity? Yes. Yes. Mr. Connell? Uh, Mr. Wexler? Yes. And Mr. Heilman? Yes, item number 17, continuation of the Citizens Forum for non-agenda items. Yep, you have to, oh, yep. I made her go up. Now it doesn't matter. Again, Jamie Ridge with the Suburban Wilson Alliance. Sorry. I wanted to make a few points based on the comments. I thought it was a great discussion that you had um, on, the, on the curb situation. Um, one of the points is that under the Municipal Code and Ordinance Compliance Act, sellers cannot be forced to make this repair. Um, it's got to be a negotiation between the buyer and the seller. Um, you cannot force the seller to make any repairs um, unless the house is going to be condemned. And so then it goes to the buyer, and they have 18 months um, to make this type of repair, and that's under the state law. Um, so you're not just talking about taking money from sellers and leaving. You're also talking about potentially a big expense for buyers that are, that are coming in. Um, in terms of the uniformity discussion, which I thought was terrific, um, you can't get there with the current ordinance for 41 years based on the past five years' sales. So if this is really a, a priority for the township, the current, current ordinance does, does not meet it falls far, far short. So again, we appreciate the discussion. Thanks. Anybody else? Yep. Tyler? Uh, just, just one other one other point. I know uh, one of the things that was just kind of popping out of me during the discussion that I, I just want to make sure is clear is that um, I, 
think the, the big thing that, uh, I don't know, is, is that the sellers, sellers have to move for thousands of different reasons. And I, I think we all, I know, depending on where you are in your lifestyle and what you see all the time, you think of, okay, they're just moving up or moving down. But so many people are being transferred because their jobs got changed, going through divorces, have lost their jobs. And when they get hit, these are the people who are getting really slammed. I mean, these, these are the people that are getting like hit on top of hit on top of hit to get out of, if they're trying to sell their house. Um, I, I think when we think of people just moving up and moving down, the, the, those folks may, I seem like they've had a good plan. You know, they've actually planned. So hopefully they might know a little bit more in terms of how much expenses they're having coming out of them. But it's the folks that are really getting killed or the folks that are having financial issues and things like that. Um, so what I, what I just want to make sure that that was, that was clear because the, the township has such a variety of, of uh, folks, which is great, but it, it creates a lot of challenges across the board. Um, the last thing uh, was I know, I know we don't want to create more taxes for folks, but it, it's going to cost money one way or the other. It's just it's out there. So again, like, like Jamie said, and I appreciate the conversation, um, you know, it, it coming up with a more holistic approach is, is just, I think it's, it's got to be the way. Um, but we are here to work with you and give you ideas and, and certainly volunteer uh, time to uh, try and come up with a good solution that can make it great for everyone. So thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? No? Uh, number 18, new business. Nothing? OK, other business, number 19. Uh, I just wanted to uh, ask the commissioners to watch Senate Bill 76, which concerns the transfer of real estate taxes, the school tax, to a property and income tax. It's just something you might want to keep an eye on. Uh, I was actually going to ask uh, Jamie to speak about it tonight, but we could do it another night since it's, it's still sitting out there and nothing's really happened. Uh, also, I wanted to ask the board, do we have a vacant property committee? Because I'm not seeing it on my list. We do. And yeah. I didn't see it in the, uh, on the committee list. And I, I had a, have a concern about Just a vacant property person. Yeah. the property at the corner of Westchester Pike and Eagle Road. That uh, gas station has been vacant for a long time. I know Mario's not here tonight, and that's Mario's ward. Mm -hmm. Oh, is that Steve's? Oh, okay, and he had to leave. Had to I just leave. I don't know if anybody knows anything about it. Yeah, Keller, what? Killer's gas yep. station. Right. Or why don't you explain Keller's that? Killer's Sunoco. Killer. Killer. Hi. Killer. Hi. The Vacant Property Review Committee is under the building code. Um, it, it is not seated by commissioners. Right. Okay, that's why I didn't see it. It's um, not a commissioner. It requires, there's a process that has to um, uh, be reviewed. It, it would be applicable if somebody walks away from a property. Basically, the taxes are unpaid. There's no one who's not who's accountable to some of the um, maintenance to respond to some of the maintenance issues. Um, Pat Colleen from the County Redevelopment Authority is on it. I'm on it. Um, there are a couple of members that are on it uh, that are local. Um, here's a realtor. There's a lawyer uh, on the board, um, and we hear. Uh, matters that are brought to the yeah. committee by the code enforcement yeah, office a um, and a determination for condemnation. There has to be a resolution approved by that board and the planning commission to take it to the county redevelopment authority for condemnation. So, Lori, a property like that, and I know all of you are familiar with it, property like that that's been boarded up for a long time, you know, what's the course of action there? Well, we have that particular case the property owner there was a I think a reverse mortgage on the home the property owner passed and I think that there are people occupying with other family members maybe occupying the property there's the mortgage company is out of Texas mm -hmm. there's no response at all to any of the um, uh, action enforcement actions that we've attempted um, so we're, we don't have a choice in that matter we're, we're going to move it uh, okay. and press for condemnation of the property which means they will physically lose title to the property. But in the meanwhile, they've been evicted and the house has been boarded up. Pardon me? They've been evicted and the house is boarded up, isn't it? Um, I don't know that they've been evicted. I know that the mortgage company was taking some action to try and clear them from the property. I'm 
for a while there was a like a motor home or something that parked in front of it and I think they get back into the house. Mm. But again, there's still there's some issues with respect to you know very well that there are property maintenance issues there. And just a, a complete lack of response. But it is under the building code. And the 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 uh, gas station is that something that's under review, or we don't know. Well, there, there would have to be non-payment of taxes. Okay. Non okay. Party. Okay. Yeah, I'll ask Steve the, I mean, about it. That, 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 it's worth a three-minute discussion about this issue because I don't think that our township residents understand how hard it is in situations like this to deal right. with vacant houses, and and maybe at the end of the day why it's not a terrible thing that it's hard to do. It takes, you know, in Pennsylvania, the rights for tenants and houses are pretty strong. And people just talk about evicting them. People don't understand how long it physically takes to evict people. Mm -hmm. um, the issue of abandoned houses in our township, when somebody stops paying the taxes or stops doing something else, you know, where the township can get involved, it's one thing. We have a number of homes that whose taxes are up to date and who are, and, and, and the houses are maintained just to the level of staying out of municipal court. Um, mm -hmm. It is very frustrating for neighbors who live attached to these homes, who live in the constant fear that the other house is infested with rodents mm -hmm. or, you know, simply that other house isn't being heated, you know, and you share a common wall with that house or other things aren't being maintained for purposes of water. Um, you know, any type of issues you have with stormwater and things like that. And, and it's very, very frustrating for, um, for our residents and for our constituents. Um, but it is very hard in Pennsylvania and in America to throw people out of homes. And it's even harder then to take, the, to take a property from somebody who lawfully owns it, even after they've been evicted from it. So it is a very lengthy process. And while it is very frustrating for those people who live around that, they just need to understand that's just part of, of, of the, the due process rights that attach. And there are few rights in our, in our American society that are stronger than the right to possession of property, the right to private ownership. And it's kind of really at the root of capitalism as well as at the root of our Bill of Rights. So. It is very frustrating. It is a very lengthy process, and people have to understand that when 18 months go by without people being thrown out or a house being condemned or torn down, um, they have to understand that that's not because commissioners and township personnel and banks and sheriffs and all those people aren't doing everything they can within the law to try to deal with that. They are doing everything within the law to deal with that, and that's how long it takes. And, and also understand that um, that this particular code is um, based on uh, the regulations that would be prescribed by the Redevelopment Authorities Act. So I think that there's a, this is different than what I think most property owners, most residents, when they call to complain about maybe a neighbor who has an unkempt property or an unsanitary property, their property maintenance um, provisions. And when we have specific enforcement criteria for that as well mm -hmm. under the International Property Maintenance Code. So, right. you know, and that could be that the owner is still occupying the property and the taxes are paid, but you're not allowed to allow that, you know, um, unsafe, unsanitary condition uh, to exist. So that would be a different enforcement measure than this particular measure. But uh, as Commissioner Holmes pointed out, they're both, they both can be very lengthy processes. Thank you. I also just wanted to thank all of you for coming this evening because it, uh, it is an issue that we're very aware of and thinking about and trying to figure it out. And we appreciate your input as professionals and as residents. And we want you to know that it's something that we are planning to address. And we're not saying that we're not going to do that. We are. But I also feel strongly, uh, as I know you do, that now, while we're living with this, that probably the best practice is to negotiate as well as you can and inform your sellers and your buyers, which you can always negotiate that the buyer absorb the, the cost of the curbing. But it's just something to keep in mind. But I know that the Ordinance Committee will look at this closely in a very short amount of time. And I appreciate you coming tonight. I thank the Board of Commissioners for listening. Is it for me? Mr. Siegel? One happy Easter. Sorry.
Yep. Happy Easter. <laughs> Happy Passover. Uh, just one brief thing. Um, after what seems like forever, um, the bathrooms have been delivered to both Paddock and Merwood <laughs> Parks. Yes, yeah. um, and um, now they're just going through the final stages uh, for township approval and connection and all of that. So hopefully they will be in operation in the near future. I want to thank the township staff, uh, assistant manager Tim Denny, and also Eric Gillard, the facility supervisor. They all worked very hard um, to get this, and thankfully it'll be done before the summer. Um, and that's all I have. Thank you. Uh, Mr. President, um, nothing other than to uh, wish all of our uh, all of our constituents and residents a very uh, happy and holy and solemn uh, holidays for everybody this week and next. And uh, that's all I have. Yes, uh, Jeff. Uh, first of all, I'd like to uh, congratulate the, uh, the Haverford uh, uh, the Haverford Heat baseball team that we're here. Uh, that's another typical example of how well Haverford High School is doing. Uh, in fact, uh, kudos go out to Haverford High School. Last week we had a, a run. It was the Kevin Kane run. And 30 of the football players from the Haverford Senior High School came down and participated in that run. And I can't think of the lady's name. Jane, you would know her. She lives right around the corner from you on Golf View there. She runs the – has to do with the football team at Haverford. She's the one that had all the pink jerseys. The pink jerseys. Oh, I know. She's yeah. escaping me at this moment. Yeah, <laughs> well, anyway. She'll she come to me tonight, yeah, I know. She coordinated the whole thing, and it was great to see all these young men there participating in this. And, of course, out in the audience, uh, Connor Quinn, Sarah Armstrong, uh, Mario Oliva was there. Uh, Jeff Heilman's heart was there. He had other things on the agenda. Chris Connell was involved. So I, we thank everyone, and, of course, Temple Lutheran Church. Uh, was the major sponsor, like they've been for years now, and we, uh, Chris and I congratulate them for participating in that. It's a great cause, and this year's success was uh, more than we've ever had before. So, uh, And by the way, Doc at Public Works has done a great job, always been there to help, help us make sure everything's there on time, and we get everything back to them, and it's picked up right on time. And uh, Mr. Denny, we thank you for the... Uh, the porta potty down at uh, Bailey Park, uh, Carol Thornton and uh, Jen Durkin, thank you for that. And also the uh, different things that you've done there, cleaning up the recycling cans and all. It's, uh, it's come along great down there. Mr. So uh, that's all I have. And Mr. happy Carol. Easter to everyone. The, uh, and, and just to add also with the Kevin King, there's never an issue with traffic or, you know, with residents or what have you. It, it comes off very well. Mm -hmm. There's yep. never an issue with it. A um, couple things with the Grange. Uh, Saturday, April 19th from 9 to noon is Cobbs Creek cleanup. So anybody that's available, if they could meet down at the Grange Estate at the Long, Bar uh, Long Barn prior to uh, 9 a.m., we'll greatly appreciate it. <clears throat> On uh, Saturday, April 27th from 1 to 3 at the Grange, Arbor Day, uh, they will have, they'll be honoring several people. And they will have music from the Haverford Middle School Choir, 7th Heaven, and with light refreshments. Uh, again, uh, April 19th for the cleanup and the 27th for Arbor Day. And school is out this week, so please, everybody, drive extra careful, careful in the neighborhoods. Uh, they're all out, and, you know, with the spring weather. They're, my gosh, they're all over the place. So please be careful. And uh, happy Easter to everyone. Bill? Happy Easter as well. I'd like to thank the Hilltop Civic Association for their annual Easter egg hunt last week. A couple hundred kids that had a great time. And then I'd also like to bring special recognition to the Hilltop Baseball and Challenger Association. This year, Hilltop on opening day has just cracked the thousand children mark in the Hilltop Baseball Association. So there are a thousand and two kids participating wow. as of opening day. But the real highlight is the Challenger Division, which also opens up a whole division of over 75 children with special needs to participate in Little League Baseball in some fashion. So I think I'd like to commend them as an association for including the Challenger League over these last 10 years, 10, 11 years, and also to the volunteers who donate their time, not only as coaches, but 
the moms and dads who run the snack bar, paint the stripes, and do all the other good work for that for a thousand kids this year. So, thank you to the Hilltop Civic uh, Hilltop Baseball Association. Mr. Gentile has something he wants to say too. And I actually just wanted to bring the the, the board up to date on um, an initiative that uh, the uh, Cable Advisory Board has been working on with uh, with the leadership of Mr. Siegel uh, and our IT staff. But the, we recently upgraded a software program and the cable channel will be uh, updated. Um, we're hoping, we're just waiting for Comcast and Verizon to change the system over to a digital system. So you'll see some uh, uh, big improvements on the cable access channel as well uh, as more um, you know, infomercials, things like that. So that'll be happening. We're hoping by uh, May 1st that should be up and running. Uh, the other thing, uh, that the, and I uh, apologize on behalf of the chief, uh, he took ill this afternoon, and we think he went home with the flu. Uh, but we wanted to advise you that the Township Police Department was just issued a specialty vehicle um, that you may see out on the road. It's not going to be a, a vehicle that you'll see out like the police department, but it is a, um, a Bearcat. It's called a Bearcat. It's a $352,000 vehicle uh, that was purchased uh, by ho with Homeland Security money. It is not... Our vehicle was not purchased with Haverford Township tax dollars. Um, it's I think we all just paid our federal taxes today, though, didn't we? <laughs> <laughs> um, this will be the second uh, vehicle that Haverford Police, where it was issued. It's actually owned. The actual title was Delaware County. Um, but the, uh, uh, because of the leadership within our police department and the standards that we hold here in Haverford Township. Urban uh, Haverford, vehicle? Haverford, Haverford. Is that through Joe McGinn? Is that uh, it's actually through the district of emergency management and, uh, and Mr. Truitt and our, our district attorney. Um, so he actually, he was out, uh, yesterday looking at the vehicle. It'll be housed in Haverford Township. It'll be, uh, basically controlled through Haverford Township. It'll be made available to anyone in Delaware County. Uh, but when it goes out of the township, it goes out with one of our officers. So, okay. So if you see that type of vehicle, and you get calls from your constituents saying you're spending more money, it's, you can explain to them that it's um, not, uh, it's not our money. Okay, I just have a couple I'm just things. gonna tell them, call Larry. <laughs> um, Saturday morning at Coopertown Elementary School, it is the annual Easter egg hunt for Coopertown Civic. Uh, 10 a.m. for the Easter egg hunt, sharp, and the Easter bunny will be there shortly after. Um, that and the St. Coleman John Newman garage sale, is on April 26th and 27th. If you have not attended this, it is an amazing garage sale. They make about $58,000. Uh, well, last year was $58,000, but uh, it's absolutely incredible. Drop-off starts uh, the 16th at uh, 1.30 p.m. So uh, anybody who has any old items that they want to donate to St. Coleman John Newman, you can take them up to the school. The people will be there to help you unload them. Uh, they actually even have people that will pick up if you call uh, call the directory. Um, that being said, um, I would like to wish everybody Happy Easter and also Happy Passover, Dan. And uh, just if we can have a motion, motion to adjourn. Who's Karen? got the info for Hanford Robotics? Oh, I'm going to get it. I'll I'll send it out. Uh, Rick Van Leuvener was going to send it. Okay. So I'll get it out to everybody as soon as he gets to me. If not, you know. Yeah, if we can. Yeah, Larry, we can put that on cable access. Yeah. Okay. Yep. So motion to adjourn. Second. Second. There we go. Good meeting, Mr. Thank you.